Prevention-based tools leave you blind to threats inside your network. By adding network traffic analysis to your SOC, you can find and stop attackers before they make their move. ExtraHop provides complete visibility at enterprise scale. Detect threats 95% faster with machine learning that helps tier one analysts perform like seasoned threat hunters. Visit extrahop.com forward slash security weekly to learn why the SANS Institute calls ExtraHop fast and amazingly thorough. That's extrahop.com forward slash security weekly. Networks are becoming increasingly complex and fragmented, and digital transformation and DevOps are driving an explosion in network connectivity changes. With each new network connection, cyber attackers may gain another opening to breach or traverse the network. At Tufin, they've pioneered a policy-based approach to network security management using automation and analytics. As a result, you can make network changes in minutes instead of days reliably and securely. To learn more about Tufin, the security policy company, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Tufin in and sign up for a free evaluation. By the end of 2020, 99% of exploited vulnerabilities will be publicly disclosed and known to IT system admins. The consequences of that fact means the burglar will already be in your house because you left the front door wide open by failing to patch known vulnerabilities. How can you keep the threat actors out? Through cloud-based automation, Automox enables you to slam the door on unpatched OS and third-party vulnerabilities across your entire Windows, Mac, and Linux infrastructure. Take advantage of a free trial with Automox to not only see the vulnerability status of your infrastructure, but do something about it within minutes. Start automating the fundamentals of cyber hygiene at securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. I like the transition between the, the topics too, because it really speaks to a lot of the fundamentals if you listen to these two segments, uh, I think you're going to be in good shape. You take that back and do stuff with it, you're going to be in good shape. Uh, quick announcement, Security Weekly is returning to Las Vegas this August for Black Hat and DEF CON. If you would like to request a briefing or sponsored interview uh, on site at Black Hat, you can go to securityweekly.com forward slash booking to submit your requests. Uh, this is a new page that I have uh, created and it basically allows you to book really anything. If you want to request a briefing, you can do that uh, on slash booking. If you want to request a Black Hat interview, if you want to submit your information because you're a guest on the show, you can do that. If you're a sponsor and you want to submit your materials, it's all at securityweekly.com slash booking, including if you're a listener and you'd like to suggest a guest for the show, securityweekly.com forward slash booking. There's a spelling error that I got to fix on there too. Hopefully by the time you hear this, it's fixed. I'm still working on the site, but it's functional enough that we're going to, we announced it on the show, which is awesome. Uh, Josh, welcome back to a security weekly show. You haven't been on this show before. Uh, Josh has done lots of pen testing over the years. You were at rapid seven, yep. area Praetorian. You've yep. contributed to the Metasploit project. You've got some more Metasploit contributions we as do. well as uh, lots of blog posts on the MITRE attack framework. So a lot of stuff that you can get for free. Oh, yeah. uh, from Praetorian and the stuff you've contributed to the community. So thank you for that and yeah. welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, I'm excited to be on the show. Yeah, yeah. this is right. awesome. So yep. one of the, and Lee is still here with us uh, remotely as well. And uh, I wanted to just start, uh, you pointed out, um, I was like brushing my teeth in the bathroom this morning, uh, like reading, like scrolling through your tweets and the MITRE ATT&CK framework updates yep. <laughs> that happened. Yep. And I thought it was an opportunity for us to discuss from the defender's perspective, what these new updates mean, sure. and then talk about some of the tools and materials that you've made available uh, to the community for free. Yeah, so absolutely. So uh, one of the one of the new things that came out um, really uh, just just today, or um, basically uh, yesterday, mm -hmm. was uh, the minor attack framework. So for those who are not familiar, it's basically um, a mapping of techniques um, that the you know, the, really the bad guys would use inside of your environment to achieve their objectives. Uh, and so what happened recently was they put out their, their new April release. Sure. Um, and so they, they, they released all of these uh, TTPs. Mm -hmm. And so um, now we have all of those uh, that we can see. And there've been some uh, additional updates. Uh, there've been some, some new uh, techniques added, new tactics added, and then also some, uh, some updates to previous TTPs that were inside of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. And so those are also super uh, interesting and useful. And so uh, we can we can dive in and cover um, all of this material. And then yeah. uh, we've also been doing some related work in how we've been able to help customers um, measure mm -hmm. uh, where their programs are at 
map to miter attack and and now, doing so in different ways what's interesting and, and i think uh you know there's a lot of curmudgeon people in our in our field right yes and, but it's good that we have that balance right because you don't want to think with any standard guideline or framework sure you're never done right security right. is an ongoing thing yep. it's a process and you should never truly like feel like you're done ever and that right. you're secure but it, what some people will say is, well, if you secure your environment against MITRE ATT&CK, you're secured against MITRE ATT&CK, and there are all things that fall outside of that. Sure. We understand that. We're not just doing MITRE ATT&CK. We don't advise that, you don't advise your clients to say, well, you just do the stuff in MITRE ATT&CK and you'll never get hacked, right? That's right. not what we're saying, right. obviously. Um, but I think MITRE ATT&CK does represent a fairly comprehensive framework for understanding how attacks work or will be conducted in your environment and for that reason, I like the new, is this an updated or new uh, section for the impact? So this, this is a new tactic that was just added. Um, okay. So this is completely new. Um, we didn't have that uh, in the past. And so with the April release for MITRE ATT&CK, they're coming out with adding the impact tactic. Um, and, and what it is, um, covering uh, 14 techniques, it's basically um, looking at the integrity and the availability attacks against your enterprise mm -hmm. uh, and, and in different ways. Um, and why this is interesting is from the adversary perspective, um, they may use one of these specific techniques and then it's something you, you may consider um, in terms of how you um, think about, you know, attributions and, and, and mapping back, you know, what, what types of things were occurring when, um, you know, something might have occurred. Uh, well, inside and, and I, I would map these back to the criticality of the system, yep. right? Yep. So yep. if you've got, uh, you know, network denial of service, sure. yep. Let me say, you know, we've got some protections there and there's only so much we can do. Yes, we should protect against it, but I'm not going to put like a whole ton of resources if the end result is network denial of service, right? But you may say if it's um, uh, disk content wiping and they can destroy all my data while I have backups, that would probably be really bad, right? If they were able to intercept data in transit, right? Mm -hmm. Like the impact is a really important aspect uh, of it because that could dictate my response and my action plan to uh, try and get my environment to be rid of the vulnerabilities uh, and behaviors that lead to these potential impacts. Yeah, the, the other thing is that the impact section here, um, you could have, uh, I, I was talking with somebody uh, even just yesterday, we were talking about the, the defacement and, mm -hmm. you know, detecting defacement on a website. Okay, well, depends on what type of defacement you actually did, because if, if we were just like wiping the site and just, you know, doing the standard, yeah. you know, this is, this is funny, this is, you know, trolling or, or whatever, um, that's one type of defacement. But then another would be maybe more strategic in the nature of just, you know, mm -hmm. maybe m making slight modifications, modifications to a website yes. and, and gearing, um, you know, people who are visiting that site, you know, based on, you know, disinformation or misinformation or mm -hmm. perhaps injecting additional information, um, you could do that. And, and then, you know, that would be valuable and, mm -hmm. you know, much harder per perhaps to detect um, when you look at like CICD uh, pipelines and such mm -hmm. and looking at like integration flows. Often what you look at is, okay, well, we have our, our, our code base. And then when the website differs from the code base, you know, that would be your, your right. type of indicator rather yep. than just saying like, you know, pull up the website and is it, does it look defaced? And that's just, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe, you know, some of these things might be a little bit more difficult to measure and, 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 you, and you can't and detect. do reconnaissance like you used to on websites anymore. Yeah. The same way. Yeah. Uh, and recently I was actually looking into, uh, I'm glad we segued here because I was looking into Selenium sure. and how sure. it's evolved over time. I haven't worked with it in, uh, a few years, yep. right? And I was doing a coding project and I'm like, basically all roads were leading to implement the Python library for Selenium. Sure. And when I went and started reading the documentation, I'm like, oh, it's like way awesome now. Yep. Because the way websites work, you need an actual browser yep. to basically look at the website. Yep. It, it's no longer like static HTML, like really doesn't exist nope. anymore. Nope. It's all XML RPC. It's all, yep. uh, you know, JavaScript based. And Selenium lets you do that. Yep. You have the DOM, you cool. have the, w the, the, you know, the web yeah, sockets, it's... you know, complex web apps. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, uh, on, on the MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework, so there, there have been updates to not just this, this new tactic, which is the impact section, um, and that, that's in the show notes as well, um, but then there's the enhancements to the existing techniques. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been, um, so one of the, one of the um, TTPs that we were contributing, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we were basically uh, recommending that MITRE did uh, make some updates. 
was PowerShell mm -hmm. um, and its capability to basically execute underneath the hood using the system management automation framework to basically uh, execute Windows API calls. Gotcha. Um, and so it's another technique uh, that, that fit under a TTP, which previously existed, mm -hmm. but the size of a TTP uh, needs to be uh, comprehensive in, in what it includes. And so if you looked at PowerShell in the past and you said, well, I've tested this, I'm good, uh, you need to make sure you got the size of that TTP and the way in which an adversary could execute it. Right. Um, you need to get that right because you could it's catch one piece. It's not just local execution on the host I've compromised. It sounds like this in PowerShell is, lends itself to this. It can make calls on all the systems in your environment. Yeah, at scale. In, in this library, it sounds yeah. like it could let you do that in an automated fashion. Yeah, so system automation is it's pretty nasty in terms of, um, from a defender's perspective, it's nasty. From an mm -hmm. attacker's perspective, it's pretty um, handy. It's, it's super handy because you can basically call the .NET framework mm -hmm. for Windows to basically bypass um, capabilities yes. for detection. Silent uh, Trinity does some of that. It bundles in a bunch of other different languages to do that. Yeah, so one of the, the techniques. In there, Silent there's, there's a bunch of things that do this. Um, there's a bunch of frameworks that utilize uh, this capabilities, and it's and it's a really uh, challenging one um, mm -hmm. for defenders to be able to pick that up. And so we we've been looking at MITRE ATT&CK and and talking a lot with customers, um, and looking at the frustrations that they've been having in terms of you know what is MITRE ATT&CK doing today and what do we want it to do in the future, um, and so making sure that the TTPs are are you know uh, comprehensive mm -hmm. um, in what they're actually uh, sure. telling people to look at. Um, such that if you're doing something a little bit differently than uh, what's written up, um, you, you might have a gap there. I find pen test firms really yeah. like the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It's a super handy it, framework. It helps it define for your customers what they need to start testing against, right? Yep. Lee, so, sorry. So I, like, I, I, I love the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It's really comprehensive, but I, when I, every time I bring it up, if I haven't looked in a while, I think of how the heck do we teach you know, IT management, how to, or how to, how to look at it, how to digest it without going, ooh, shiny, now it's too much to digest. Sure. So um, I think, you know, you, you obviously have to have focus, right? And, we, and when we talk about like patch management and, and, and all of that, um, what's interesting with MITRE ATT&CK is you can actually start measuring um, and narrowing that focus to the TTPs inside of your environment where um, you can actually, you know, tackle um, and make some changes. You wouldn't want to tackle the entire MITRE ATT&CK framework all at once, but you could say, let's take um, a handful of TTPs and focus on that uh, this quarter or, or this month, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And so in terms of maturity modeling, the other thing that's interesting is MITRE ATT&CK is also giving you a metric. The metric for the number of new TTPs or updates that they're making to the framework mm -hmm. every release cycle. And so you have the adversaries, the, the most advanced adversaries like NSA, you know, the, the, the groups over in China, Russia, et cetera. Um, and, and, and that's the most sophisticated mm -hmm. organization, you know, um, adversaries in the world. And then you have the MITRE ATT&CK, which is basically a mapping of, you know, here are the new TTPs that are coming out. And then you have enterprise organizations. And depending on where you fall, um, if you're exceeding the capabilities or the number of TTPs that MITRE ATT&CK is addressing in each of their release cycles, then you're able to have a chance against the you know the most sophisticated adversaries. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're lagging behind, right. then you need to maybe do some catch up or make sure that you're allocating resources mm -hmm. in the right place um, because you're definitely not um, in, in in the right place in terms of you know, you, what you're covering on a on a on a regular cadence. Josh, do you recommend breach and attack simulation as part of measuring your organization against MITRE ATT&CK? Yeah. So. Example? You you have to be able to measure it. If if you can't measure it, you know, it's it, this is this is just you know not going to be useful at all. And so what we did was we basically built out a framework for how organizations could do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we actually put out a recent blog post, uh, and it's in the show notes uh, where you basically take MITRE ATT&CK and you map it into the Metasploit framework. Yep. And so with that, you can say now I can measure the effectiveness of my defense program mm -hmm. against MITRE ATT&CK and know how I'm doing for a specific DTP. In, in and done, to, done in a variety of different ways. You can't just do a TTP one way, because right. there might be multiple ways that, that a TTP could be executed. And, and so measuring each would Metasploit be Metasploit doesn't critical. handle all of the MITRE ATT&CK Correct. either, Correct. right? Because there's Correct. just things. Correct. Yeah. And there's lots of different open source projects yes. that you can use to test your defenses exactly. compared to MITRE ATT&CK. I don't think any of them are quite comprehensive. 
even in the commercial, it's hard because some of the things yeah. in MITRE ATT&CK are just things that it's really difficult to automatically test, right? Right, like the hypervisor, um, TTP yeah. is a super challenging one. Mm -hmm. uh, not all the sophistications, um, not all the, the the level of effort for each of sophistication is, is is different. So depending on the TTP, you have some of them that are very sophisticated. Um, and so like only the, the APT level actors could mm -hmm. execute this. And so where do you start? You start with, you know, the least sophisticated and then sort of work up the chain right. towards those that um, are the more sophisticated. Well, and because it's going to take so much more effort absolutely. for anybody to do it that if it's if it's that much effort and resource intensive, that there'd be few adversaries that could do it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I like that because you can start by reviewing the MITRE attack, implementing some open source tools to exactly. start measuring, yep. and then as you fix some of the lower uh, severity or easier things to fix, right. you can start maturing and say, okay, maybe we'll look at some commercial tools to help exactly. automate that. What I found is that the open source tools work work okay. Yep. If you're just trying to getting started in testing, I think as you move in that maturity model, you're probably going to want a commercial tool. If I were getting ready for a pen test from Praetorian, right, I'd want to be at the level where I had a commercial tool that was helping me automate a bunch of tests and in building that into my processes so that as we find stuff, we have a process to fix it, which is important. Um, and, and then having the penetration test, I think that really is where we're at today in terms of assessing your environment in this light. Sure. So what we've done for clients on that and, and mapping the maturity models back to MITRE ATT&CK, um, we're actually working with um, a number of organizations and we're doing regular purple teams with them. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is that we've done um, we've done the, the purple team and, and we iterate on it because so that you can measure your effectiveness mm -hmm. and where you're, you're allocating your focus. And then the idea with that is that it's preparing them for a red team style engagement yep. where it's, you know, completely, um, you know, you have the red team, you have the blue team and you know, you're, you know, a goal oriented style test. Right. Um, and it's, and it's a very comprehensive view of, okay, we've invested in MITRE attack and then, you know, what does a real world adversary do? Uh, and, mm -hmm. and where are the gaps and, and would they be successful? Right. And proving or disproving uh, all of that. And, um, and it proves your, your investment was uh, valuable. Right. And none of that's, I mean, some of it might be easy. It runs sure. the spectrum, right? Because yep. it's interesting when I've presented on some of the top like windows, uh, I, uh, vulnerabilities and exploit doesn't, but the configuration issues that are often preyed upon by attackers. Exactly. And for some, that's easy. Like I talked to some, they're like, yeah, like implementing laps, they're like, that was no big deal. Right. And other organizations are like, oh my God, that's that's really hard, right? So it depends on what your infrastructure looks like, depends on what the skill level is of your various administrators, whether it's Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, right? Um, that's a determining factor as to how easy or difficult it is to address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of people like, like just kind of stick their head in the sand <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we're just going to try our best to patch stuff and, and, and hope for the best, and that doesn't work today. Yep. Um, you really need to look at all of these issues and, and then have a plan to start tackling them one by one. Because I think it was you, Josh, that said you can't do all of the MITRE attack in one big project, yeah, right? you got to break it up and, and move through your levels of maturity, and that's going to differ per organization, right? Absolutely. They may have a really awesome you know, Windows administrator that's got a few of those things and it's just easy for them, but then you're going to hit parts where you're going to be like, yeah, that's a little more complicated project. But this is all things that you should start prioritizing and working through. Yeah, some of it, some of it, w when you look at a TTP, the data sources, the data that you actually need mm -hmm. to be able to properly detect what's going on, mm -hmm. um, if you don't have the data sources to begin with, then that right measure. there would be yeah. would be the indicator that you need to actually do some work. Right. Um, so if, if you take PowerShell as an example, um, do you have your PowerShell logs, you know, being being you know sent to a system where you could basically right. do some correlation there, mm -hmm. or is there anything that's looking at those logs? Um, you know, th these gaps those just from a data sources perspective. Yeah. You look at the data sources. So, are you doing good logging on your endpoints? So, if you're if you are an attacker and you're jumping on a system, mm -hmm. you're typing a bunch of commands. You're doing the normal reconnaissance of the network and the local host. That is going to feed into a centralized, you know, log management system. If you have that, and if you're and if you're at a minimum just taking that as a whole, then at least you have the data mm -hmm. um, to be able to make some detection rules. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you don't, then you know that's 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 a definitely uh, one place you could you could start. It, it's potentially three in that example, three yep. mini projects, right? Yep. It's we have to configure our hosts and endpoints and servers to collect that information. Yep. 
then it's a project to say, well, we need somewhere to send all that and collect it. Yep. Then it's probably another small project to say, based on that TTP, here's how we pull it out of yep. all that data and also operationalize it so that when we see a variance, there's someone who's going, oh yeah, that system needs to be updated. So we got to write the rules for the specific TTPs. You know, one example, you have MS build or you have this other utility, um, you know, that basically, if you have two tools that would give you code execution if you were, you know, on the system. Mm -hmm. um, if one of them is going to give you a lot of false positives, then you have to sort of work around uh, some of that, um, which is um, one of the things that we see a lot when we actually interface with clients. It's like tuning and tweaking the rules such that you don't overwhelm anyone with the alerts. Mm -hmm. um, is this a normal behavior that should be right. occurring a lot on systems? Uh, for example, one of the TTPs we were contributing um, was basically uh, the built-in Windows compiler, CSC. So we can actually just drop C-sharp code on, an, on a system, mm -hmm. compile it, and then execute it from there. Um, mm -hmm. And so is that a normal activity that you would expect to see occur right. on you know, an executive system? Probably mm -hmm. not. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you got to know your environment, and uh, this is a great framework to, uh, to benchmark it against. Absolutely. Uh, so. Lee, sorry, did you have uh, questions, comments? Uh yeah, I was just saying that I, I love I love the model of knowing knowing the direct environment and really looking against TTPs, but maturity, we keep coming back to it. I'm wondering how, how many organizations are not really ready for that level of maturity and and, and proactive nature, because it it would be really cool to do that everywhere. Yeah, so so for that, if you haven't really invested in your um, in your tech stack to be able to say we don't have any um, we don't have a lot of tools in terms of logging, monitoring, detection. Um, being able to benchmark um, to MITRE ATT&CK is probably unnecessary at this point for, for that type of organization. If you're not there in terms of the sophistication, this is really useful when you start making those investments and being able to validate that spend. Was it effective? Or maybe let's say you have a bunch of tech uh, tool solutions in your environment, but you want to be able to validate how effective are they? Um, so we've paid these vendors to basically already be in the environment. Um, are they doing anything? Are they are they looking at the network? Are they uh, maybe it's a service provider or you know we ship all of these logs to the third party? Are they doing anything with them? Are they able to um, you know send us email or be able to respond to it? Uh, if if you don't have any maturity, um, then I would say looking at like the NIST CSF, which is um, that's a framework that we use right. to, for benchmarking um, security. Um, as a whole to being able to say, here's where we are. If you don't have the data sources for the TTPs, then you can't be able to detect or respond to them. So uh, at that point, I would say focusing on on the program first mm -hmm. um, and looking at the NIST CSF for, would be you know a good first step for somebody who doesn't have uh, anything that's in place for, for um, I mean, this is really the framework I, for measuring detection capabilities. I've run into a number of places where they have a bunch of tools installed and purchased, but not necessarily configured or optimized right. for anything beyond check the box. Sure. That may have been a bit cruel, but it makes the point. And I, I like the CSF as a starting point, but we got to get way past that. Yeah, agreed. Some of the standards and frameworks out there are really basic, and that's one of the things I like about MITRE ATT&CK is yep. it, it gets you to start thinking about those things that, you know, we've been trying to evangelize for years and say, you, you really need to worry about this one thing and it's in a presentation, it's in a blog post and it's scattered all about. What MITRE did was like collect all that stuff and put it in one place. So yep. now organizations have one place they can go to to start leveling up uh, in, in hopefully an organized manner, right? You, you don't want to tackle these things all at once. Uh, what's nice is you've... Looks like you've got a custom Metasploit build that lives inside a Docker container yep. that will help you automate all these tests. Did I capture that right? Just scrolling through some of the, the notes on your GitHub page. Exactly. So what we did was we took the framework that we were building internally uh, and we open sourced it. We basically mm -hmm. putting it out to the community. Um, and what we use it for uh, internally is when we when we go in and we do a, a regularly uh, purple team engagement, um, the source code is, is right there and it's available. Mm -hmm. So you can take it and use it. Um, and we use it to be able to help uh, clients measure their effectiveness of their detection program. Mm -hmm. And so it basically sits uh, right with Metasploit. Um, and so these are just modules that allow you to drive specific TTPs in, in a variety of different ways. Uh, since that's uh, important 
to ensure that you're you're measuring uh, the effectiveness of those TTPs. I feel like it's a good usage of, of Metasploit as well. Yeah, I, I mean know a lot of pen testers yeah. today may use some of the tools, but they're not exactly. using Metasploit as a their you know end all be all framework today. It's a yeah. lot more custom tools uh, that's happened in the past you know five to ten years. Um, but this is a great usage of of Metasploit, take advantage of the framework to test against this specific uh, benchmark. 100%, yeah, and we, we included, I believe it was over 100 TTPs inside of the framework, and so it's it's freely available. There's a write-up on our blog about it, uh, and so if, if people want to go, contribute, and um, really just make uh, make it better, because uh, we, we see it, we saw it as a gap in terms of uh, what we what we needed as a team, and so we, we felt that Metasploit made a lot of sense in terms of um, not having to build our own agent, Mm -hmm. um, it's an agent that we're pretty familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, we ju we, we've been using it for um, really just looking at these different TTPs, and then looking at okay on the back end, what are we what are we seeing in terms of detection and response? Right. So that's awesome. Yep. Um, so uh, all of this is open source and available to the community, correct? That is correct. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. Uh, I like the usage of uh, Docker here too. Yeah, Docker, Docker made it uh, actually super easy to do the deployments. And yeah. so getting everything set up and managed uh, inside of a Docker instance, uh, it just it just made it made it easier to be able to not need to worry about dependencies and you know, know, the setup experience, process. That's been right? It's, the dependencies you know, will, will kill you. We don't, we don't really need to worry about that with a Docker instance. And you so you can just the environment, yeah. spin it up and uh, just sort of run with it. And, you know, makes deployment super easy because you don't need to worry about, you know, the Metasploit installs. It's just mm -hmm. sort of turnkey and works for you. It would be really neat to see reports of uh, tests using this. Uh, like right now, we're gearing up for a bunch of uh, of audits, uh, internal and external. And I'm thinking it would be really cool to have one of those teams show up with a tool like this to see how we're doing. And maybe a little uh, <laughs> self destructive in that, but I, I just the idea is really attractive. Uh, do you see people picking this up and really using it? Yeah, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I think I, I think it's um, I think it's the best uh, approach, especially for a team that has invested in detection coverage. Uh, if you can start working on using the same tools that um, would be used to measure your defectiveness, um, your detection um, against a, a common set of frameworks, um, then that's exactly what um, you know we would recommend to clients. Yeah, I, so, I, I think it addresses those gaps that really bug us as security professionals, right? Yeah. Because you run a vulnerability scanner or patch management, and that's just one piece of the picture, right? You can have other types of audits, right? But And those are valuable, but we always, I think we always felt like as a community of pen testers and security researchers that there was gaps. And then even go to the security industry side and the vendors and people implement products sometimes not the way they're meant to be implemented, which also incurs gaps. And we just spent all this time just trying to like point out these gaps. Well, now here's finally something that I think is much closer to what um, you know seasoned security professionals on the attack side and, and researchers are like, okay, now we're getting a little closer to like the way attackers and pen testers are really behaving, giving the defender some way to gauge their environment as to how much they can defend against those particular techniques. Yeah, so... What we saw when we when we looked at the uh, the space was that uh, there were some other alternative uh, open source um, products and frameworks. Yeah. But we Caldera, thought that Caldera was one. Yeah. Right? So 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 there there was one by by Miter um, mm -hmm. where it basically simulates a, a variety of TTPs inside of your environment. Um, we wanted finer grain control over how things worked rather than sure. an autonomous approach. Uh, and then you also have the source code for all of the TTPs as well. And so. If you want to do a TTP slightly differently, you want to modify it, you want to do it, um, you want to add to it. Mm -hmm. That's that's the perfect place in terms of you know fostering the community around, you right. know, pushing a lot of these efforts. And so, um, it made a lot of sense for us. And then where I see it going is um, organizations will probably start picking it up because they know that they need to measure um, their programs against mm -hmm. MITRE ATT&CK. And you know, if, if this is a a great resource which has good coverage, a um, hundred uh, or more TTPs inside of the framework then you already are starting out of the gate with something. Uh, well, and what I like too is it's getting us in that mindset that you have to test not just the effectiveness of your defenses. That's right. one part of it. Like, do my defenses actually pick up on an attacker? Like, I've configured this thing, right. whether it be endpoint or whatnot, and endgame is very much in tune with minor attack as well. And that's one thing. But the other thing is if there is some type of event 
uh, how do I respond to it? So incident response yep. in addition to remediation of those fixes. Right. And this kind of pushes you forward in both of those areas, which again is kind of a gap that we've identified over time is that you've got, maybe you've got some really good tools, but they're not configured to detect some of the ways that attackers are behaving today. Yep. And the response, how do I find if they've either tripped an alarm or worse, they haven't tripped an alarm, how do I find them? Right, and then once I need to figure out how they got in, someone's got to go fix something, right? An administrator at the end of the day has to fix something. And I think using this process with MITRE ATT&CK really helps you push forward in those areas, which is really kind of the crux of the issue um, with security today yeah, and some lack of, thereof. Some of the TTPs uh, you, can, you, can, you can handle and tackle and, and mitigate mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in full or you know, partially, but then also on the you know detection side, right. you know you could have you know partial or full complete mm -hmm. um, detection coverage, and so depending on the organization and your uh, your threat profile, you you would handle that uh, differently. Mm -hmm. So if you're a small organization, you could you know focus efforts on maybe more prevention, and if you're a larger organization, maybe you even it out more so, or maybe you know push to make sure that we're, you're covering all the bases evenly. Mm -hmm. um, and so each organization might do things differently, and so then. Uh, with that as understanding, you could say, well, I, I've already validated that, you know, maybe pass the hash isn't applicable inside mm -hmm. of this portion of the environment. And, you know, maybe I'll shift efforts towards, um, you know, something else like, uh, you know, looking at uh, exotic ways of doing, uh, you know, C2 or you know, exactly. something like that. So variety, yeah. variety of ways to, to approach the problem. I think the uh, two segments so far in the show have really kind of laid the foundation to where you want to focus your efforts, right? You, you need good patch and configuration yep. management and not just identifying the flaws, but as Jay said, being able to fix them and, and do some remediation, have that automated, have that constantly checking is so important. And then you come to this segment and you're like, these are the things we need to be testing our environment against. If we don't have those things, then we need to probably have those things to be able to prevent or detect uh, attackers, right, and respond. Um, and, and this helps you kind of push through all of that. So I think there were a great kind of melding of, of topics uh, in the show that really give people a great kind of blueprint as to not like how to be secure, right, but how to build your program uh, and, and push your people and technology forward to mitigate your risk. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, the minor attack framework as long as you're, you know, looking at it on a regular basis and like continuously mm -hmm. um, enhancing your detection capabilities mapped to a framework, mm -hmm. then you're you're covering uh, really important components. It's yes. not, you know, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is not a complete framework of every single TTP that is right. possible. Yeah, uh, sure. There are gaps mm -hmm. um, between what's possible and what's in MITRE ATT&CK, um, and we're trying to address those gaps as mm -hmm. quickly as we can. Um, it's better than not having it. Yeah, I think because was my point is it, it basi right? it, it's yeah. basically a framework for defenders to say, what is it that the attackers like to do? Yes. And give me the menu and, and of what, what they would do. And that's what we're blocking and presenting about, right? And then you can say, here are the things that they like to do yes. if they were on a system in the environment or if they were trying to break into the organization from mm -hmm. the outside. And so it basically it gives you the attacker's playbook. Yeah. And, and, and the most common know, playbook. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that was my frustration is I talked to people like, like it, Josh and pen testers and I'm like, so like what really cool <laughs> techniques? And they're like, basically like pass the hash and mimic cats like still works yep. <laughs> and no one's fixing them. And then we'd yep. go to the defenders and say, you really need to, to fix this. And then it would go down a rat hole. Now it's a, it's better because we have a framework that we can point them to of the most common playbooks for attackers, I think. Right. And, and the other thing that it does here is you take, a TTP like PowerShell, for example, you can see all of the different groups that have used PowerShell. Mm -hmm. So you can say, at a minimum, we address this TTP. It's gonna, it would have impacted these different types right. of adversaries because we know that this particular TTP is one of the favorites for these different groups. Yep. Um, and they've used it in the past, and so that would be uh, a good way um, to consider how you might narrow your focus towards a specific TTP uh, versus another. You mm -hmm. could say, well, looks like we'd have wide uh, impact if we were addressing this particular TTP mm -hmm. um, and cut these attackers off just by using it. So Yeah, I think it helps uh, narrow your focus too. 100%. If you know you've, you've wiped out some of these TTPs and there's an iterative process to make sure that they don't creep back into your environment, yep. now what you're, you're looking at in your uh, security operations can be a lot more of a narrow focus rather than going, well, our patch management's kind of broken in a lot of areas and 
a configuration that's addressing these attacker techniques is not really that great. So basically all the alerts, we've got to do a lot of investigation. I think if you do these things, you can really narrow the focus and be a lot more effective at potentially uh, catching attackers uh, at a more constant rate. Yeah. Although I feel like some of the weird things that the nation states will do or really advanced attackers are going to be difficult to find no matter what. But if you're limiting yourself to that style of attacks as best you can, you're in a better place. Yeah, if, if you look at the attacker's playbook and you say, you know, what is it uh, that they like to do? Mm -hmm. And if you build in strategies to remove those from the table, yep. um, you know, defenders have home court advantage yes. when, when these things happen, right? Mm -hmm. So they can, they can say, what are, what, are the, uh, what are the techniques that we want to take off the table mm -hmm. and make it not even possible or likely that this would be successful? Um, if, it's, if it's possible, then we need to detect it. Mm -hmm. If it's not possible, then you know, the detection um, is basically there. But, um, but yeah, no, that's, that's sort of a good way to think of it, um, you know, looking at what you know, coaches in sports like to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, great defenses will look at the offense and they'll just remove those things from, right. you know, right. from, from the playbook. And so uh, you know, double team you know, their best player or yeah, you know, exactly. whatever, whatever is needed. So, Take out their most yeah. effective weapons. Yep, exactly. Like so the there you have it. So awesome. You have everything that these attackers like to do. And so that'll help defenders uh, really narrow their focus because there's, there's a lot of noise in the industry. And so uh, That's true. It, it's definitely a good way to help narrow focus. And, and focus is critical, especially in security because oh, the yeah. only thing that changes is uh, only, ch only changes uh, are constant. That's right. That's right. Constant well, with change. that, we're going to take a short break, come back, talk about the enterprise security news for this week. Josh, thank you very much. I encourage everyone to check out uh, MITRE ATT&CK and uh, your new Metasploit uh, project, which is on the Praetorian GitHub page and link to in the show notes. Excellent.